Every faith tradition has a story. The story is used to inspire and anchor that tradition's beliefs. Often the story is a mixture of real events and mythology. Do we have a story, a tale that anchors and inspires us? I think we do. We touch on it every Sunday when we recite our covenant and when we sit or attend, even virtually, in this sanctuary. Like many faith traditions, our story begins with one person. In our case, that person is Augustus Conant, the founding minister of UUSG. Augustus had a full and adventuresome life. So much so, I can't cover it all in one service. Instead, I'll focus on the last two years of his life. This is when Augustus served in the Union Army during the Civil War. What you're about to hear is based on actual documented events, no mythology. Our story begins on this day, July 31st, in the year 1861. The Civil War is in its fourth month. On one hand, it's easy to understand why Augustus joined the Union Army. He was a dedicated abolitionist. He spent his entire adult life giving speeches and sermons about the immorality of slavery. But his unwavering commitment also alienated people. After starting this church and serving here for 16 years, membership had dropped significantly because of his relentless preaching against slavery. So the church elders met with him and urged him to stop for the sake of the viability of UUSG. Augustus loved it here. He was the architect of the covenant we recite every Sunday. He literally built this sanctuary. But he realized he was doing more harm than good. So he resigned and accepted a position with the Unitarian Church in Rockford. Leaving UUSG broke his heart. Besides being an abolitionist, <clears throat> Augustus was committed to pacifism. Ten years before the Civil War started, Augustus joined an international organization dedicated to ending all wars. The organization was called the League of Universal Brotherhood. When a local chapter was formed right here in Geneva, Augustus was asked to give the keynote address at their very first meeting. It is my honor to introduce to you, Reverend Conant. Ladies and gentlemen, the organization has one and only one purpose, to stop war. Our objection to war is simple, it is wrong and it is inconsistent with the Spirit of God. We know wars cannot be stopped and peace cannot be realized until the miseries brought on by injustice and inequality are eradicated. We also know that war is sustained by public opinion. So we must show the public that there are better ways to settle disputes than by fighting. Let us use our pens against the sword, our newspapers against the rockets, and our love against cruelty. Augustus went even further. As a member of the League of Universal Brotherhood, he was required to make a public pledge. I, Reverend Augustus Conant, hereby pledge never to enlist in any army. When the Civil War began, Augustus held two moral imperatives that appeared to be irreconcilable, stop war and end slavery. In order to act on those two deeply held beliefs, he used one of the concepts in our covenant, our aspiration to promote practical goodness. He decided to join the Union Army 
not as an infantryman, but as a chaplain and a medic. And these two roles, he could support the soldiers both spiritually and physically and advance the cause to end slavery without having a direct hand in the fighting. So at the age of 50, Augustus left his wife and three adult children and joined the 19th Illinois Infantry, Volunteer Infantry. As Augustus sets off to join the army, let us sing a patriotic song of that time. The words to the verses will be projected on the monitor. Please stand if you are willing and able. Augustus's early days in the 19th Regiment went well. He established a friendship, an alliance, and alliance with two key members of the regiment. The commanding officer, Colonel John Turchin, and his wife, Nadine Turchin. Their friendship was founded on their shared belief that slavery was morally wrong. John Turchin had been a colonel in the Russian army and served during the Crimean War. After the war, he and Nadine immigrated to the US. They left Russia because they opposed the autocratic reign of the Tsar and admired the promise of freedom and equality in America. When the Civil War broke out, John and Nadine were living in Chicago. Their friends petitioned the governor of Illinois to appoint John as the commander of the 19th Regiment. The governor agreed, and as the commanding officer, John had the authority to select the chaplain, and he chose Augustus. John's wife, Nadine, accompanied him on all of his military campaigns. Even though this was against army regulations and would lead to, and would lead to a, a lot of grief for them in the future. She regularly carried a revolver and dagger in her belt. As a direct descendant of Russian nobility, Nadine was literally a Russian princess. She was highly educated and spoke four languages fluently. She served as a nurse for the 19th Regiment, and she and Augustus worked together in the hospital. When Augustus wasn't attending to wounded, to the wounded, or giving sermons, or teaching the soldiers to read and write, he was a strong advocate of the temperance movement. No alcohol, no swearing, and no gambling. This naturally put him at odds with some of the men. One day, a teenage soldier came up to Augustus in a panic. The teenager had lost $90 in a poker game. That's the equivalent of $2,500 today. Augustus knew the older men in the camp were taking advantage of the younger men, so he counseled the boy. He complained to some of his fellow officers, but to no avail. When Augustus noticed the older men in the midst of another poker game, he marched over to them and grabbed all the money off the table. 
One of the players sprang up from his chair, grabbed him by the neck, and threatened to knock his head off. Augustus calmly told the poker player he was handing the money over to Mrs. Turchin, and she would use it to buy medical supplies. When the poker player backed down, it was unclear who he was more afraid of. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> However, as the days wore on, Augustus encountered more and more struggles. One source of struggle was an unexpected adversary, a religious leader who supported the Union, but who, treated, who, but who threatened Augustus's rapport with the men. This Christian evangelist came from Chicago, and his name was Dwight Moody. <laughs> now get this. <laughs> Moody grew up in a Unitarian and Universalist household. As a young adult, Moody rejected these religious views and became a Christian evangelist. He made it his mission to convert everyone he met to Christianity. One of his techniques was to confront people on the street and to demand to know, are you for Jesus? Are you a Christian? If they said yes, he'd invite them to one of his revival meetings. And if they said no, he would invite them to one of his revival meetings. <laughs> Either way, he was going to get them to listen to one of his sermons. <clears throat> Moody, Moody periodically visited the Union troops, and when he arrived at the 19th Regiment, he began holding prayer meetings and delivering sermons, completely ignoring the fact that the regiment already had a chaplain. It didn't take long for Augustus to notice fewer and fewer men attending his meetings and his sermons. It became clear, Moody disapproved of Augustus's Unitarian theology, and he wanted an Orthodox Christian as the chaplain for the 19th Regiment. Moody went to Colonel Churchin and complained. He complained that Augustus wasn't preaching enough wasn't praying enough, and wasn't converting enough men to Christianity. Then Moody escalated his complaint to General Sherman. Augustus described the situation this way. Suppose a stranger comes to camp and claims to be a, a doctor, yet he doesn't have a diploma or any other credential, just his word that he is a doctor. Then the stranger announces that the regiment's physician who is trained and accredited, is unfit to serve the men, and that he, the stranger, is the right man to be the regiment's doctor. Augustus was frustrated, and some of the soldiers were too. They had come to appreciate and respect their chaplain for his energy and commitment. Augustus did more than preach. He made benches and stools that kept the soldiers from having to sit in the mud. He gathered straw for their beds and vegetables for their meals. Even Colonel Turchin objected to Moody's interference and advised General Sherman to ignore Moody's complaint. General Sherman responded by tossing Moody's complaint letter into a flaming pot-bellied stove. <laughs> Moody was annoying, but he, but he was merely a nuisance compared to Augustus's other adversary, Union General Don Carlos Buell. <laughs> Buell was the commanding general and Turchin's superior. Buell's family had owned slaves. Even though, even though he was on the Union side, he also sympathized with the slave owners. 
and defended their quote unquote property rights. As the 19th Regiment moved south, they encountered runaway slaves who sought refuge with the Union Army. The runaways were often employed by the Army as laborers or employed by individual soldiers as hired help. Augustus hired a runaway by the name of Andy to be his cook. They established a friendship and Augustus taught Andy to read. Buell tolerated this, but when push came to shove, Buell always supported the slave owners. And when they demanded their runaway slaves be returned, Buell gave them up. One day, Buell sent soldiers to Augustus's tent because he suspected Andy was hiding inside. Augustus stood at the entrance, blocking the way. He told the soldiers, you may not enter. The chaplain's tent is a sanctuary for all. After tensions escalated, Augustus was forced to step aside. When the soldiers entered the tent, Andy was nowhere to be found. Augustus had already warned Andy, and he was able to make his, his escape. Augustus was furious with Buell's next, was furious, but with Buell's next affront, it was even more personal. Soon after Augustus joined the army, he learned that his wife Betsy was pregnant with their fourth child. The baby was born on March 10, 1862. Augustus was thrilled to have another son, but he was conflicted over what to do. He felt an obligation to support the soldiers and an obligation to be back with his family. As he came closer to his one year anniversary in the army, Augustus made a formal request to be discharged. Now keep in mind the average tenure for a chaplain on the front lines at that time was six months. Augustus had been there almost a year. And during that time, he was never permitted to return home for a visit. On the 4th of July, Independence Day, 1862, Augustus sent Betsy this letter. My dearest wife, General Buell has refused my request to return home to you. Since there is nothing we can do, please go upstairs to my study and have a decent cry over the bad news for the both of us. Then go back downstairs and have a good laugh to take the sting out of our deep disappointment. As we imagine Augustus's longing to be home with his family, let's sing another popular song of the time. This song is Home Sweet Home. Please stand if you're able and willing. I'll sing the verses to this and invite you to join me on the chorus. And um, this is how the chorus goes. Home, home, sweet, sweet home. There's no place like home. i 
The beginning of the end of our story takes place on December 30th, 1862, outside of Murfreesboro, Tennessee. The 19th Regiment was attached with the Army of the Cumberland. In addition, Augustus's oldest son, Nayroy, was with the 74th Illinois Infantry, and his unit was also attached with the Army of the Cumberland, so both Augustus and his son were together. A fierce battle was about to begin. It would involve 75,000 soldiers. It would last three days. It was officially named the Battle of Stones River, but the soldiers would later refer to it as the Battle of New Year's Hell. Knowing the battle was imminent, Augustus wrote to Betsy. I feel dreadful for missing another Christmas with you, and especially for missing the first Christmas with our baby boy. I'm also sickened and disgusted at the doings of war. But bad as it is, the injustice and oppression perpetrated for ages is worse. So if this war is needed to achieve justice, mercy, and truth, we must fight until the end. The generals for both armies decided they would attack on the morning of December 31st. On the eve of the battle, each army moved their troops into position. It was a cold night, the ground was frozen, and there was a light snow. The men on both sides were ordered not to start campfires in fear of giving away their positions. The Union troops <clears throat> Excuse me. The Union troops had spent the previous five days traveling through the mud to get to Murfreesboro, and they were in no mood to sleep in the cold and the dark, so they ignored those orders. The Confederate soldiers stayed in the darkness and used the light from the Union men's campfires to quietly creep closer and closer until they were only 100 yards away. Then the two armies settled in for the night. Both the Union and Confederate armies had bands that played to entertain the troops. And that night, each band began to play. It literally became the Battle of the Bands. <laughs>
Then one of the bands started to play a familiar tune and the other band soon followed. With the two bands playing in unison, all the soldiers on both sides listened to one of the most beloved songs of the Civil War. And for a brief moment, they shared the bond of brotherhood as they all longed to be home with their loved ones. At dawn on December 31st, the Confederate forces attacked. The Union men were making their morning coffee and were caught by surprise. Nayroy's unit was overwhelmed within minutes. It wasn't until mid-morning the Union forces managed to stop the progress of the Confederates. But during those first few hours, the Confederates captured 3,000 Union prisoners, including the hero of our story. Augustus and his ambulance team had been searching for wounded when they suddenly looked up and saw they were surrounded by the enemy. At that moment, Augustus's heart sank. Being a prisoner of war was one of his worst nightmares. He began to pray.
Augustus needed to act fast. As he put it, he parlayed with his captor, a Confederate officer, and informed him they were rescuing men from both sides, which was indeed true. The Confederate officer, convinced Augustus and his ambulance team were doing more good than harm, let them go. But before Augustus left, he pushed his luck further. By asking some Confederate soldiers to help him lift a wounded Union man to be closer to a fire, Augustus described the scene this way. We grasp our hands together in one strong brotherly grip, knowing we'd never do so again. It was, one of, it was the best right hand of fellowship I ever gave or received. As the battle raged on, Augustus took on the roles of a assistant surgeon, nurse, and messenger. One soldier recalled it this way. I can never forget the, the 31st of December when our chaplain labored all the night long through seeking the wounded. I can hear his voice loud and clear in the still air, crying out, any wounded here need help. He labored to the end, taking no rest. Indeed, Augustus worked nonstop for those three days and nights. And when the battle was over, he collapsed and was rushed to the hospital. His son, Nayroy, had survived the battle. While Augustus was hospitalized, Nayroy looked after him and gave Augustus sips of blackberry wine, which Augustus liked better than the medicine provided by the doctors. <laughs> I don't know if that has something to say about the temperance guy or how bad the medicine was. <laughs> Lost my place. <laughs> Even though he was seriously ill and struggling to breathe, Augustus was uplifted by the achievement of his lifelong mission. During the middle, right in the middle of the Battle of Stones River, on January 1st, 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation was enacted. The former slaves of the South were now set free. A few weeks later, Augustus was set free too. On February 8th, he died of pneumonia. His body was sent back to Geneva where his old congregation welcomed him home and hosted his memorial service right here. Colonel Turchin sent a letter to Betsy. It said, Mrs. Conant, I avail myself of this sad opportunity to express my sympathy to you and your family, and to testify that in Mr. Conant we have lost a friend, a go the government, a devoted soldier chaplain, and our cause a warm advocate of loyal principles. At the end of the memorial service, Augustus's baby boy was christened. The child he never got to hold was named Augustus Turchin Conant. After the naming ceremony, Betsy presented the boy to the gathering of family and friends. With the sunshine shining through our sanctuary windows, everybody stood. If you are willing and able, please stand. They sang to celebrate a life that had just ended and a life that was just beginning. Let us join in singing Spirit of Life. We'll sing it two times, once in honor of Augustus and once for his son.
Please be seated. Take the flame from this chalice into your hearts. Remember Augustus Conant and his story, our story, of compassion, service, and practical goodness. Let us use his story to anchor and inspire us. Please remain seated for our postlude. Before you leave, I want to thank everybody who contributed to this uh, particular service. So the techni technical team, Jeff Steibel, Scott, and the others had to work a lot, very hard to get all the mic stuff squared away. So thanks to them. Also to William Elbert, who is the voices of the characters. <laughs> and to the musicians, uh, Cynthia Spiegel, Ruth Cavanaugh, Michael Mackey, Linda O'Neill. I, I also wanna give a shout out to Tom Zimmerman who was supposed to be a musician today, but fell ill, so miss you, Tom. 
I think they're going to do a little, a little jam thing going on. So I'm just going to say, go in peace. Yes, we'll rally around the flag.